there's no supplement. There's no, you know, yes, nutrition can be helpful, but there's no detox protocol or any, any type of lifestyle. I mean, basically what I'm trying to say is like so many people will want to get healed and, and change their life. But if they refuse to look at the trauma at that, that's causing it, that's causing an off-road nervous system, that's leading to all these downstream issues in the body, um, they're not going to get better. And so I love that you brought that up because that is something that's the biggest, I think, takeaway from this conversation is you're going to heal at the level of which you work on your trauma. And that, that goes for any autoimmunity, <laughs> gut issues. I mean, the vagus nerve from the brain is what controls the gut. And so it's like, if that's off because of trauma, of course, we're going to have gut issues. So I just wanted to, to, to pinpoint that. That was really good that you said that. Hey everyone, welcome back to the reshape your health podcast. I'm really excited for part three with Ashley Simcox today. She's a registered nurse and a functional nutritional therapy practitioner. And she is here today to talk about antidepressants and then her own personal journey about antidepressant withdrawal, which doesn't happen to everyone, but does happen. And we wanted to bring awareness to the topic, but then also just her personal health and wellness journey. Um, she is such a delightful soul. Um, I hope that you guys can kind of sense that from the podcast or YouTube, but I have just really gotten, um, quite a lot of joy and pleasure out of these interviews. And we hope that you are finding them helpful. So Ashley, welcome back to the podcast. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me again. And the feelings are mutual. Yeah. So let's dive into your story. You can start wherever you want, um, related to your health and your wellness and the chronic disease and how you found your way to that functional nutrition, uh, program, and then kind of how you help people now. Yes, absolutely. Thank you. So I was always really, really healthy. I never had <laughs> colds. I don't even think I've ever really even been on antibiotics. I mean, I just was always really, really healthy. And, um, in 2017, I, um, was, I was taking an antidepressant. Let me back up a little bit in college. I got on an antidepressant known as citalopram or Celexa and not necessarily because I was depressed. It was more so, um, that I was just feeling, um, a little bit worn out and, um, in nursing school, you're exposed to traumatic things such as death and dying and suffering and things like that. And I didn't have the tools to really deal with that very well. So I ended up getting on an antidepressant and that was in 2007. And so I got on that and I, I would say it probably did help me a little bit. Um, I think it numbed things to where I wasn't being so um, just affected by what I was seeing every day in the hospital. And so I ended up just staying on it and it just kind of became something I did. I just, I took my antidepressants. So come 2017, um, I was just kind of wondering like, why am I taking this? So like, I just kind of got to a point in my life where I was like, I'm not depressed. I don't have anxiety, but I've been on this antidepressant for, you know, 10 years. Um, why am I still on it? And so I was like, I'm just, I'm going to get off of it. I don't, I don't think I need this. And so I, uh, attempted to get off of the antidepressant over four weeks. So I cut the dose in uh, a quarter each week, which is standard. Um, but I ended up getting really, really sick from that. And um, I had um, extreme withdrawal symptoms, um, which include all kinds of things like panic attacks and depersonalization, intrusive thoughts, and being constantly in fight or flight. And so I wasn't quite sure what was going on at the time. And so I reinstated and, and got back on it because I was like, something is really off here. Um, and then a few years later, well, actually, I'm sorry, a few months later in 2018, I attempted to get off of it again. So now I took a quarter of the dose every month. So I tried to get off of it over four months. So cutting down on the dose one, um, a quarter each month for four months. And the same thing happened. But this time I was like, I'm not going to get back on. I'm going to just see if this kind of works itself out. And so, um, about a week after my last dose, I started having extreme symptoms. Um, again, the, the panic, the fight or flight, the intrusive thoughts, depersonalization, but then it just started getting worse. It started turning into more of a um, chronic fatigue situation. And then I started dealing with heart arrhythmias. I was actually going into atrial arrhythmias. Um, I was dealing with, um, endocrine issues, meaning um, thyroid was not regulated, um, reproductive hormones were off. I was basically just in menopause, like my body just shut down making hormones because of the, the brain, essentially what happens when you go through antidepressant withdrawals is brain is similar to brain trauma. Um, and I can explain that a little bit more if you'd like for me to, but um, for some people, 
it creates such a shift in the brain that can cause trickle down effects um, to the endocrine system, the immune system, and other issues like that. So that all happened in 2018. And yeah, it, it led to about a four year period of all kinds of strange symptoms you know, ranging from chronic fatigue to, you know, not being able to uh, make hormones and then ended up with an infertility diagnosis just because the body, which all relies on a balanced nervous system to be healthy and to operate functionally, everything was off kilter because the signals, you know, from the nervous system that regulate the immune system that regulate the um, endocrine system were all off. And so this downstream systemic effect of what happened when I abruptly, which over four months doesn't sound abrupt, but in, in antidepressant withdrawal world, that actually is very abrupt, um, abruptly removed that medication. Um, it, I can't, I don't know if you want me to get into like the down regulating of the receptors of serotonin. I do. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So what happens is when you're on an antidepressant for as long as I was, and then you come off of it, um, what happens is the serotonin receptor. So an antidepressant like Celexa is a selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor, an SSRI. And it's probably the most common antidepressant that is prescribed is, a, is a, a, an SSRI, that class of medications. And so what that does is it blocks reuptake of serotonin in the nervous system. <clears throat> and so you have more free flowing serotonin in the brain, um, which a whole other <laughs> road I could take this down is we've actually got new research out today as of this recording that does confirm that the serotonin hypothesis of depression is actually been debunked and is not necessarily at the root of the um, depression issue, but that's a whole other topic. But what antidepressants do is they create in the brain and increase serotonin by blocking its reuptake. So instead of the cells grabbing onto more serotonin, SSRIs block that, and then you have more serotonin, which is supposed to, the theory is that you'll be happier and have less depression. So you're taking this medication for all this time, blocking that reuptake. And then once you abrupt it, uh, abruptly remove it, then you have um, this down regulation of those receptors. So now you've got, you know, receptors that are like trying to take on the serotonin, but they can't. And so it's a matter of um, being able to give the um, nervous system time to build up the receptors to be able to uptake serotonin again. But what this does is it creates what's called a limbic like a limbic system injury or limbic kindling. Um, and if you know anything about brain physiology or anatomy, the limbic system is the part of the brain um, that has um, your fear response, your memory recall, and really just overall fight or flight primal. It's like your primal brain, right? And so this damage happens in that brain, that part of the brain that really just kind of knocks you into fight or flight. Um, just subconsciously, I remember telling people when I was going through antidepressant withdrawal, like, I feel like I'm about to get on a plane that's going to crash, but yet I'm not like nothing is, I don't have a reason to have this panic attack. I'm fine. I'm safe. I'm happy. But when you have limbic kindling due to the trauma caused by abrupt cessation of an SSRI, you will feel like you are having extreme panic, um, fight or flight, something impending doom, something really bad is about to happen out of nowhere. And so, um, over these, so that's kind of to explain a little bit of how, um, the uh, abrupt withdrawal of an antidepressant can cause, when I say like a brain injury, that's essentially what's happening. The other side of why some people have an issue getting off of an antidepressant comes down to how you metabolize the drug. So not everybody metabolizes drugs in the same way. So you have in, um, um, with, with drug metabolism, you have what's called the cytochrome P450 um, enzyme. And so there's a lot of um, people people have different speeds at which they wrap, they metabolize um, different pharmaceuticals. And there's actually a test you can get called the gene site test where it's a, a swab and they send it off and it can show you a profile of how you metabolize certain drugs. And so um, I didn't know this at the time when I was going through antidepressant withdrawal, but you know, later on ended up getting the gene site test done and found that I actually really rapidly metabolize Celexa. And so um, what that means is that the half-life, um, well, how, let me explain it a little bit better. Basically my body metabolizes it really fast. So I have a higher increased risk for having withdrawal syndrome um, and need to taper off of the um, antidepressant very, very slowly um, based on 
not only how long I was on it, but also the genetics of the, the cytochrome P450 and how my body utilizes and metabolizes the drug. So this explains why not every single person that gets on an antidepressant goes through an extreme antidepressant withdrawal and subsequent chronic illness. Because, you know, when I was going through it at the time, I had friends saying, I was on an antidepressant and I just got off and I was fine. I'm like, that doesn't help because I feel like something's really wrong here. But then once I, you know, lived in this world and dove into the research and figured out what was actually happening, um, it just turns out that I rapidly metabolized it um, and was on it for a really long time and, um, you know, really got off of it too soon um, and too fast. And so that's essentially what happened and what led to me being um, chronically ill and dealing with chronic fatigue because that was just such a shock to the body and had so much downstream damage. So will you back up just a little bit on the down regulation of those serotonin receptors? I believe it is. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to give people a really clear picture so that they can visualize what was happening in your brain. And so I'm going to try my best, but I want you to fix it. (laughs) Okay. Um, so the way I see it was maybe like a learned non-use because it was a selective serotonin inhibitor. Is that the SSR reuptake inhibitor? Mm -hmm. And so the goal of that was to have more serotonin floating around in the brain reflowing for quote unquote, a better mood, which we can talk about. Mm -hmm. Um, So it's almost like a learned non-use. If those receptors aren't used to taking up the serotonin, you remove the medication. Mm -hmm. So they're not being inhibited anymore with the medication, but they've become lazy. Right. And that's what I meant by downregulated. You explained it so much better, Dr. Morgan. Yes. It's, it's the downregulation of the serotonin receptors. Absolutely. They're like, they have a job to do. They haven't done it in a while because the medication has blocked it. And now the nervous system dysregulation will take place. Mm -hmm. Yep. So, um, that's in geriatric PT. It's just, you know, learn, like they learn to be helpless, you know, in the assisted living facility or the nursing home, people forget how to put their socks and shoes on because the nurse aide can do it faster. So it's a learned helplessness. So that's kind of in my brain, that's kind of how I was visualizing it, but I just wanted to be sure that that was, um, accurate. So before we move on with your experience, do you want to just maybe briefly open this Pandora's box about the research that's maybe saying, um, serotonin, serotonin may not be as involved in depression or how did you word that? Yeah. So in this kind of holistic world that I'm in, and even in the antidepressant world, it's, it's been commonly discussed that the serotonin deficiency being the reason for depression is, is invalid because there hasn't been any clinical research there. It is not, it's just simply been a theory. It has not been in any type of published literature at all. Um, that ser- low serotonin causes depression. And so this, just as in this last month, I believe it was, and I forget, I'd have to um, find the, the research, um, but there's been research that has come out that, that really debunks this, that shows that it's not necessarily low serotonin that's at the root of depression. I mean, there's, knowing what I know now, there are so many reasons for depression. Yeah. It doesn't necessarily mean that you have low serotonin and that you need to be on these medications to boost serotonin. In fact, the reason why people, including myself, feel better after taking an antidepressant is widely argued that it's a placebo effect that, um, and by placebo, meaning you're taking something with the, the thought that this is gonna help and it actually does because of what you're thinking about it. I don't know if I'm explaining the placebo. Yeah, no, yeah, well. that makes sense. But if you believe that you take this sugar pill um, and it's actually an antidepressant, then you're gonna have less depression because you think, think you're taking an antidepressant type of thing. Um, and so, yeah, I don't know um, if that, okay. So the, and the research coming out now, and I wish I would have looked it up a little bit more before we got on here, but, and um, it is basically debunking, um, the low serotonin theory, um, to depression, which is really awesome because it's in a sense validating what a lot of people are going through. Um, because if you think about just psychiatry and polypharmacy and psychiatry in general, patients are saying these things, Um, patients are having these reactions, these medications are getting off of them, but they're not necessarily always being heard based on the premise of you have mental illness or, you know, there's almost like this invalidation. So to have this research come out recently, has been really, really awesome for the, you know, mental health community. Yeah. So I think that 
one other question that I had from that would be, okay, if it's not the serotonin, what is it? Yeah. All kinds of, all kinds of things. Oh my goodness. So man, um, we could get into all kinds of things. So gut health, you know, if you have poor, a poor microbiome, like we talked about, um, in the last episode, gut health, you know, we build a lot of serotonin in the gut. So if you have, um, poor Mm -hmm. gut bugs, um, you have a bunch of stealth infections and and opportunistic infections and things like that, that's going to be a reason for, um, depression hormones, you know, you know, low progesterone, if your progesterone is low and progesterone in in women is our feel good hormone, it's, um, progesterone. So it's going to be your, like, it rises when you're in just like making a baby. So progesterone helps you feel good, helps you make babies. Um, and when those are low, when that is low, um, you can feel more moody, more depressed, have anxiety. That's a big reason for postpartum depression is after the baby's born progesterone tanks. Yeah. So that is a, a, um, an explanation for that. Um, trauma that hasn't been dealt with. What have you been through in your life in your, in your childhood? Have you dealt with it? Because subconsciously, you know, trauma is still manifesting if, if it hasn't been worked on. I really like, um, what I love, what I use to help with, um, some of that was a program called DNRS dynamic neural retraining system. Um, and that is a great program to help you rewire your, your brain and get out of trauma loops, because we don't realize sometimes that reason we're having depressive symptoms is because subconsciously there's a a story that's playing. (laughs) And then there's also a physiologic, um, pattern that's going on that's leading to depressive symptoms. Um, you know, there can be all kinds of things like anything like a a B vitamin deficiency or your lifestyle. Are you getting outside? Are you moving your body? Um, I mean, just so many reasons for depression. Are you in toxic relationships? Like, what do you know to be true about yourself? Do you, do you have low self-esteem? Do you talk poorly to yourself? I mean, these things, um, absolutely can lead to depression. Um, just trying to think there's just so many other things, but yeah. I think those are all good. I have a quote I wanted to read you. Mm -hmm. Um, and this is from Dr. Don who I'm interviewing right after you actually, but his episode won't air until later this fall. Um, and he, uh, really helps people kind of get out of those chronic negative loops, um, that tip that for him, it it manifests a lot of, uh, a lot as anxiety, PTSD, depression, a lot of times, like you said, it stems from trauma. Yeah. And so what he said was teaching people to live with manage and cope with the daily stress doesn't fix the problem. Yeah. The solution comes from understanding its source and providing a long-term permanent solution. Yeah. So I thought that this was really interesting that this conversation mm-hmm. and Dr. Don's conversation were lining up. Um, and I wanted to learn a little bit more about your, if you don't mind sharing about your personal experience with depression and like, Mm -hmm. okay, you kind of mentioned like you were in the ER, you didn't have the the skills to cope with this, but like, do you feel like that's where your depression kind of stemmed from or where do you think is the source and how, what is your long-term permanent solution? So like, how are you working through it without an antidepressant? Yeah, that's so good. That is so good. I would say absolutely started in childhood and I'm fine with sharing, you know, I grew up in a, um, home where my father was abusive and, um, there was a lot of addiction, alcoholism in my family. There was abandonment issues, things like that. So I had a really, really, really rocky childhood. Um, I think I was staying by myself by the age of nine because my mom had to work nights. So, I mean, I, I really, um, from a very young age, um, was not, did not feel safe. And so if we go back to talking about that part of the brain, the limbic system, that is your, the part of your brain that is activated to keep you safe. So that's the part of the brain that kicks on whenever you um, know not to touch a hot pan. That, that, that's the part of the brain that's going to say that's dangerous. And so the limbic system is constantly surveying your environment to keep you safe. And so if at a young age, like me, nine, seven, even younger, feels that this world is just inherently not safe, that's going to carry on into how I live the rest of my life. And, and so, um, by the, so that was kind of my childhood. I think I did therapy and things like that. And by the time I got to college and was in nursing school, I would say like, I don't feel that I was depressed, but I do feel that that had a lot to do with me not being able to cope and deal with the demands of nursing school and seeing suffering. Because again, um, with a sensitive nervous system, like I've had, 
seeing people die and in, in, um, especially working in the ER, you're seeing unsafe things, the consequences of an unsafe world every single day. So that's your, your brain, especially in the hippocampus and the, in the limbic system, it's going to remember, recall those memories and prove that this world is not safe. And so that contributed to, I think, you know, me getting on the antidepressant. So fast forward to life now, I, you know, remember back then I didn't know all of that. I just, when you're in the primal oh. brain, you, all you know, is that, you know, you need to stay safe. And so now, like I talked about the dynamic neural retraining system has been really, really helpful to be able to understand that the trauma loops that um, are replaying in my subconscious are, are inherent. Like I may logically feel safe and feel good, but somewhere, somehow deep down, something's triggered in my, in my subconscious nervous system to say, Hey, this world's not safe. And so then there's anxiety, then there's panic. And so doing DNRS to be able to understand based on using past memories and future visualizations to get out of that trauma loop um, has been huge. And I can go into more of that if you'd like, but then also I think there's so much that goes into healing from trauma and we talk, everybody loves to talk about healing from trauma, but what does that look like? So right. for me, um, therapy has been helpful um, in the last year or so um, with just our adoption that brought on, that triggered a lot of um, a, adoption, a, 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 a trauma. We adopted a baby about four months ago. Um, and so therapy using the instinctual trauma response is a method of therapy, which helps you to kind of understand where your trauma came from. That's been really helpful, but something even more simple is having boundaries. I have to be very mindful of who I'm around and I put my energy and time into because now I feel it. Like if I'm around and um, toxicity, negativity, it wears on how I feel. And so I'm really mindful of that eating nutritious. And that's, you know, to answer your question that you asked at the beginning of the podcast, what led me to doing, going from nursing to functional nutrition was in the beginning of my health journey, realizing that when I ate healthy and my blood sugar was balanced, I felt better. And that had a lot to do with giving me more balanced mental health, just making sure I'm not on the blood sugar roller coaster, right. eating processed foods that cause neuroinflammation that um, cause more symptoms to be, you know, symptoms to be worse. I also really love um, just getting still and getting quiet. I think we live in a society today where we are bombarded with processing information. I mean, we're on social media, we're scrolling, we're just getting tidbits of information thrown at us. And at some point in our day, we have to find a way to just do like, like deprive ourselves of all the sensory input to help the brain regenerate. Um, one way that I love to do this is float tank therapy. I don't know if you've heard of that, but you can actually um, float in water and Epsom salt, which is similar to the um, buoyancy of the um, Dead Sea, where you actually float and you get into this little capsule and you float in the um, float tank and you, it's dark, um, you're floating, there's no noise, and it's essentially a sensory deprivation. So you can actually go into pure consciousness because you are not um, dealing with sensory input very much. You're floating, it's dark, you're not hearing anything. It's a really, really a great way to just recharge the nervous system. So that's been really helpful for me to um, heal from trauma as well. Okay. I have a comment and then a question. Okay. I'll two questions. Do you watch the show billions on I Showtime? That's a good so one. boring when it comes to shows. I don't know any of them. <laughs> okay. Well, we just finished the last one. And, uh, in the season finale of the most recent season, this guy does the sensory thing similar to that, but it wasn't an, an Epsom salt. It was like this thing and he goes in and it's this lights. So it's like a light that okay. changed light colors. So I just had that random, yeah. that random thought in case yeah. anyone else watches billions out there. <laughs> um, and then my question that I really would love to dig into is that D the dynamic nervous system retraining mm -hmm. or how did I say that right? I want to be sure to mm -hmm. give that credit. Yes. The dynamic neural retraining system. D I was close. Yeah. I'm going to write that down. <laughs> Hold on. Yeah, let me yeah. write that down. So I'm sure to not forget it. So dynamic neural uh -huh. retraining uh -huh. system system. Yeah. Can you please tell us about that? Because I feel like this is, um, a topic that is not talked about, which is why I wanted to bring it up with you. Why I'm having Dr. Don on yeah. their like, trauma is a huge impact on some chronic health issues. Yeah. And 
I think that, I don't know if it's shame, like shame to bring up our trauma, shame to talk about it with other people, or if it's fear, I think that's probably a huge part of it is like just fear of reliving that trauma again. And the pain of the trauma Mm -hmm. for a lot of people, just like the fear of going through it again without a guaranteed outcome of feeling better might not be worth the Mm trade-off. So I think it's also really important to highlight that your, your trauma was layered. So it kind of started in childhood, kind of went through nursing school and the ER, the, the newborn phase with the adoption, um, the, but even before that was the withdrawal from the antidepressants was actually a traumatic experience. And so a lot of people think of trauma as like, you know, the big T trauma, but there's the little T trauma too, that we often overlook. So Mm -hmm. first of all, just kudos to you for doing all this work on yourself. Okay. Second of all, let's talk about that system that you found so helpful and really walk us through what was the experience like for you? And then what are some tools that you took from it that you kind of maybe revisit to sharpen your tools, to sharpen your mind? Absolutely. Absolutely. And what I wanted to touch on, on something that you said about trauma being the root cause of so many things. I have some clients in my practice who I have to literally have the conversation that if you don't find ways to work on the trauma. I don't know if I can help you. So it's really important to note that as we're talking about trauma right now, to also understand that there's no supplement, there's no, you know, yes, nutrition can be helpful, but there's no detox protocol or any, any type of lifestyle. I mean, basically what I'm trying to say is like so many people will want to get healed and and change their life. But if they refuse to look at the trauma that that's causing it, that's causing an off-road nervous system, that's leading to all these downstream issues in the body, um, they're not going to get better. And so I love that you brought that up because that is something that's the biggest, I think, takeaway from this conversation is you're going to heal at the level of which you work on your trauma. And that, that goes for any autoimmunity, <laughs> gut issues. I mean, the vagus nerve from the brain is what controls the gut. And so it's like, if that's off because of trauma, of course, we're going to have gut issues. So I just wanted to, to, to pinpoint that. That was really good that you said that. And then as far as the dynamic neural retraining system, it's an awesome program. A lot of people that have nervous system issues, as well as things like, um, chemical sensitivities, um, and food sensitivities, any, any type of, limbic system or nervous system dysregulation that leads to somebody feeling unsafe that therefore is causing symptoms, POTS, postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome, people that have really high heart rates and their nervous system is unable to regulate slowing down and speeding up the heart rate. And so these people, you know, are dealing with dizziness and fainting and things like that. These type of people do really well in DNRS because what the program does is it teaches you a one hour practice that you will take with you for however long you need to use it. You do like a for, like a week long boot camp that teaches you this practice. And what the practice does is it helps get you out of the trauma loop. And what I mean by that is when we're in this fight or flight trauma loop and we are concerned about whatever the safety thing, whatever the safety or lack of safety issue is, we have to get our brains out of that and get our brains into a healing, um, not just parasympathetic mode, but even like a theta state. I don't know if, if it's a state I, in which the brain waves. I yeah. just looked up the different types of brain waves in preparation for my interview with Dr. Don, because he oh, okay. talks about like how people are in the alpha wave and he likes to help them get to the beta wave, which is like a little bit more relaxed meditative state. Yes. So yeah. yeah, if you've never kind of looked at the brain waves and you don't know what we're talking about, just Google alpha beta brain waves, and then yeah. go to Google images and you can kind of see what you're talking about here. So, so far, what I have is it's kind of like this week long boot camp mm-hmm. that removes you. Is it, is it an in-person experience? No, you, um, okay. when I went through it, it was, uh, you paid for it and they sent you DVDs. <laughs> that okay. was only, not that old. It was only like four years ago that I did it, but I've heard from my clients that it's actually online now. So you okay. do it in your own home regardless. Yeah. Okay. And so during this week long boot camp, what are they doing? What are they teaching you? Uh huh. So the founder of DNRS is Annie Hopper. She actually was very ill herself with chemical sensitivities to where she had to wear a mask in public. I mean, she was really, really ill. So she, and she, I believe is a, a neuroscientist of some sort. Um, and, um, she developed this, this, 
this um, exercise. And so essentially what you do is you, you go back to a past memory that brought you joy and you, you think on that and you meditate on that and you elicit those feelings of that because in order to get our brains from that stuck trauma loop, we have to give it a new message. We have to give our brain a new message. We have to shift. And the way to do that is to recall memories because remember our memory processing center in the brain is in the limbic system. It's in that primal brain that is like, are we safe? Are we okay? And so if we can give that part of the brain a little bit of a break and go into a past memory that brought us joy where we were not sick and meditate on that and think on that. Now our brain gets a new message and now our body's getting sent a new message of how, because our, our, our conscious brain doesn't know the difference between past, present, and future. And so if we can elicit the feelings of a past memory that we were well, we were happy, we were joyful, then the body feels like it's actually in that. And then in part of the, um, app, um, exercise, then you switch over into a future visualization. So, okay, now you go into your future. What is your future going to look like? Healthy, healed, whole, what are you doing? And you get down to the details because your brain thrives on details. So the more, you know, for me, one of my favorite future visualizations is being on the beach and just dancing and being goofy because the reason we're sick is because sometimes our brain can't get goofy enough. And so sometimes getting silly shuts off that analytical, you know, trauma loop and gets you into um, this state where your, your nervous system can actually heal. So you get into a future visualization um, and your body doesn't know if that's past, present or future and it starts sending those messages. Some other like pillars or just kind of um, neuro, and I guess I didn't even say this, but this is all based on the principles of neuroplasticity, rewiring right. the brain. Um, and so being able to create new neural pathways, because for a long time, scientists thought that our brain was hard fixed, that there is no way you could change it. But we now know that we have the power to create new neural pathways. We're either creating pathways that lead to illness or we're creating pathways that lead to health. And we can kind of hijack that by doing these exercises or just doing the pillars of, of neuroplasticity, such as using your non-dominant hand to eat. So if you're right-handed, maybe you eat with your left hand. What's happening there is your, your brain is like, whoa, this is actually really new information. We never use this hand. And as you're doing that, you're creating new neural pathways in the brain just by learning. Learning is a um, neuroplastic um, bonus. <laughs> like I took up piano lessons. Why? Because I can learn how to play the piano and give my brain a new message that gets me out of that trauma loop and into learning. Um, the other, you know, important things with neuroplasticity is obviously gratitude and being able to be grateful. I mean, that the, the parts of the brain that need to light up and gratitude light up big time. Like gratitude is huge. Um, but yeah, learning, using your non-dominant hand, anything to help kind of calm into the parasympathetic, like some simple things would be humming or, you know, gargling. I mean, some of those are kind of silly to think about, but being able to just shift your nervous system to a more parasympathetic state in and of itself can help. But really you would need, if you were going to do what I did, doing the program was exactly what I needed to give me the steps. And then also the education, that whole boot camp is full of so many scientists. Um, oh my gosh, some of the greatest um, um, experts in neuroplasticity she brings um, onto the program. And so, um, yeah, you learn the science behind it and then you learn the um, exercise and then you get to do brain surgery on yourself to help get your nervous system out of those trauma loops. So it's hard. It's kind of hard to explain until you actually go through it. Um, but it, it's, it's, it changed my life. And it was one of the first things that I did after the brain Im da damage from the antidepressant withdrawal in my case to help reset things and to bring back balance to my nervous system. So I'm a huge fan. Yeah. And we'll, we will link that one up. That's why I took a note of that in the show yeah. notes. Um, did you do any supplements or anything like that to bridge off of antidepressants? Mm -hmm. I'm so glad you asked this question because it, when you're in the thick of antidepressant withdrawal, your nervous system is so destabilized that you're reacting to things. So I tried to, I tried to do magnesium or I tried to do fish oil and I would get really sick because remember you're, when you have limbic kindling or damage to the limbic system, everything's a threat, right? And so even that's why some people end up having food sensitivities or chemical sensitivities because that, that threat radar has been over primed. So supplements for people in the thick, in the very beginning of antidepressant withdrawal is very like not recommended because you're more than likely going to 
have a hypersensitive reaction to it. So I, for probably that first year could not tolerate any supplements. And now I, I take things, um, just, you know, probiotics and, you know, fish oil and things like that. But as far, and you want to be careful too, with things like St. John's wort, 5-HTP, L-theanine, any of these things that help somebody that's not going through antidepressant withdrawal. If you're going through antidepressant withdrawal or on antidepressants, you want to be careful with some of those supplements because you can have what's called serotonin syndrome, where you um, now have way too much serotonin and it can cause, it can be lethal. So um, you really want to be careful with um, those supplements and if you're, if you're experiencing antidepressant withdrawal. So I think my next question, which maybe we should have started with would be some, how would somebody know, like if they're going through antidepressant withdrawal and they need to like, start it back up again. So your symptoms were pretty severe. Do you know if it's always pretty severe or how long, how do they know if they're going through this and if they maybe need to back up and try again for getting off the antidepressant? Yeah. Yeah. So you would know, because I mean, it is very profound, the changes. I'm not somebody who, I mean, I remember one day just driving down the street and feeling like, oh my gosh, something really bad is about to happen. And I started hyperventilating and having chest pain and having, I mean, you just, you will know based on your symptoms. And I will say this for me, my antidepressant withdrawal symptoms did not happen until a week after the last dose. So I had a whole week of like, oh good, I'm done with that. Thank God. I'm good. I'm Mm -hmm. good. And a week later, um, just profound anxiety and profound, um, fatigue and dis- the dizziness, the cognitive things the um, proprioception was off. I mean, it just, you feel kind of like you're floating. I mean, it, it's, it's, it's really strange. Um, and you just can't miss it. But what I will say is some people, so everybody's different. So some people will start feeling those symptoms as they're tapering. So if you if you cut your dose, um, you may have those symptoms. Um, for me, I didn't have issues going down on the dose. It was after my body had been without it for a while and it's recommended not really by the medical community, but kind of in the antidepressant groups, um, that I found help on in, when I was going through, because no doctor that I went to go see could understand what was going on. So I had to turn to the internet and I found, um, surviving antidepressants.org, which is a forum online forum for people and, that are going through antidepressant withdrawal. It helped me so much because on there I could learn, um, kind of what's recommended for people like me who are having a harder time getting off of antidepressants. And it was recommended that you don't reinstate any more than one to two months after going off of it. So if you're having those um, symptoms and you're like, okay, this withdrawal is too much. I need to go back on it. You want to make sure, you know, and of course this isn't medical advice. Do your right. research, talk to a yeah. practitioner that hopefully understands it, but it's recommended to reinstate it in those first two months to work. Because sometimes if you reinstate later than that, getting back on the drug will not always take away the uh, withdrawal symptoms. Um, so yeah, I, that's kind of, that's ended up what I had to do to be able to go off of it slower, but, um, but yeah, one to two months to get back on it. Um, that's, it's just like something that you just don't hear about, you know? So I'm really glad that we're having this conversation and Mm -hmm. I wanted to segue into how did that then kind of ignite your journey to like better health when you experienced the fatigue and you experienced all these symptoms from the antidepressant withdrawal, like you gave some resources, you talked about the trauma, but then just physically, how are you healing your body from, from this? Yeah, that's, that's such a great question. You know, what led me into, you know, doing what I do now, working on a more holistic approach was going through this massive thing, being in the ER with heart arrhythmias, because the heart arrhythmias were due to the dysregulation of the nervous system and and causing actual arrhythmias and not finding answers in the same community that I had worked in for 11 years, like navigating the medical system as a patient and not getting answers and getting kind of told like, Oh, you need to be on more medications and you, you need to be on this and that. And just feeling so completely let down and I'm not dogging the medical system. I'm grateful for what it does well, but in a case like what I went through, there were no answers for me. So I turned to more holistic ways of, of healing and finding out about how important the nervous system is. And so, um, so yeah, so that's kind of what led me down this road and, and not only, not only in, in the antidepressant realm, but also just 
health overall. Like right. I learned about gut health in nursing school. I didn't learn about getting into the parasympathetic to heal in nursing school. Um, and so learning, just relearning what health was really all about was so powerful to me. And I was like, I have to, I'm, this is my calling to do this for a living. Like I know this information, I can't not do something about it. Um, and so now what I do, um, just to stay healthy is, you know, when you go through any type of trauma, you can also have, um, decreased ability to um, deal with toxins and stealth infections and things like that. So yes. now kind of some of the repercussions of um, that trauma from the antidepressant withdrawal include chronic fatigue, but okay, what's behind the chronic fatigue? Is it, um, you know, stealth infections, toxicities, is my body not detoxing well? So what I work on now is just really making sure I'm giving my body what it needs to be able to detoxify and um, to keep my immune system strong. And um, I'm really a big fan of working on blood sugar regulation, which is how I found you yeah. uh, because I needed a little bit more structure different from what I was trained in about how to, um, you know, deal with blood sugar regulation with fasting and watching my carbohydrates, tapping into autophagy and, um, you know, working to like heal my body that way. Um, and then I think a lot of mainly what I do now is, is a lot more nervous system work. I've kind of gotten to the point, you know, four years later where it really just comes down to making sure that I'm doing things to keep my nervous system intact um, and knowing what things cause me to feel like my nervous system is unstable and, and working on that. And of course, with a, with a four month old, <laughs> it's a whole other level of, of healing. Sometimes those, those moments away, it's about the deep breathing and settling the nervous system to go back and do some more. So. Oh my goodness. Yeah. We could unpack that. Um, so I think let's share some of our favorite ways to what I call exercise, the parasympathetic nervous system. And because I've talked about this before, but if you're a high achiever, you're a high capacity worker, you might feel like this stuff is a waste of time, yeah. but it's not, mm -hmm. it's not a waste of time. It improves your health. It makes your mental clarity and focus better. And it makes you more efficient when you are working. Yeah. So, um, some of my favorite ways to activate the parasympathetic nervous system, um, a tip that you gave is in a previous episode, but just relax mm -hmm. when you eat especially like, so take some deep breaths before you eat. I really am intentional to not, um, eat when I'm working, if I can help it. Like you saw me today in office hours, I was drinking my smoothie. Cause I've had literally back-to-back -back calls all day long. And I was like, that's the only, that's the only time I'm going to get my lunch. I have a half hour break so I can make a smoothie, <laughs> but if I can help it, I really try to eat in a rested state every single morning I get up and I try to do my mindset work. And that includes reading my personal faith formula. Mm -hmm. Um, and then I do my gratitude. So I really like to journal on three specific things that happened in the last 24 hours is my favorite way to practice gratitude mm -hmm. that gets you in the parasympathetic state. Um, I hate rushing. I've yeah. recently, <laughs> I've recently discovered so I think another strategy that I use is schedule blocking. Like I'm, I don't like task shifting. That is not a productive way of work for me. Um, so I'm trying to do better about blocking off my schedule. Like this day is for content writing. This day is for meetings this way is this, you know, so that we're being very intentional about how we're structuring our day so that we're not causing undue stress. Right. Another thing is leaving buffer time in the car, like for driving, I don't try to wait till the last minute anymore. I try to get somewhere early so that I'm not in fight or flight, like white knuckling my way there. Yes. Um, I think we you've touched on it, but I am so big on really trying to improve the quality of my diet right now. Um, so really reducing alcohol, reducing added sugars, reducing refined seed oils, um, reducing exposure to toxins, those kinds of things to reduce the activation of that, like stress response. Yeah. Awesome. Um, those would be like my go-to. And then I, my, my one at night is just cuddling with Justin on the couch. Like physical touch is one of my big love languages. So oh, hugging my kids, like exercising will, will do it for me. Some yoga, some walking outside, um, cuddling, those kinds of things. Those are just some practical strategies. If people are like, well, what do I do to like get in a parasympathetic, parasympathetic state? What are some of your favorite ones? 
Oh, yes. So many, I talked about some of the bigger things like float tank therapy. Um, you know, I love, I get a massage every two weeks. That's where I feel like the most yes. like on the table. I'm like, okay, I am not in fight or flight right now, but something so simple that you can do right now is you can drop your shoulders and you can take a deep breath so many times. And I often on my social media will put like, oh, just like, Hey, right now I need you to drop your shoulders and take a deep breath and let your jaw rest. Because those are two things that we don't realize sometimes, like if we're doing stuff, I know holding a baby, I'm just like this all the time. And so just letting your shoulders relax, letting your jaw relax and taking a deep breath can shift you. And you can do that in the middle of a, if you're in a business meeting, if you're, if you're a teacher, I mean, whatever it is that you do, you, you can take just a moment to shoulder drop, jaw drop and take a deep breath. And that is a big, big, just it'll shift. And if you did it just now, you might feel um, that you shifted a little bit. Um, and for me, I can't stress enough boundaries with, with people, but then also spending time with people that, that fuel me, like friends that and I feel 10 times better when I walk away from them. That is going to be huge. Um, meditation and prayer and, you know, whatever it is that, you know, you, you do in that um, type of thing. I, I love the Headspace app. I also love the Insight Timer app. Those are two apps that you can use for guided meditation. Um, that's also something that I, I really like to do. Um, I'm just trying to think. Yeah, and I, I think just overall starting your day with like, oh, how could I forget it? <laughs> starting your day, not like on your phone. If you can yes. plug your phone in on a dresser that's far away from your nightstand and check your phone later. If you are starting your day, checking your social media, checking your email, check, you're starting your day off in a highly primed sympathetic state. How many likes did I get? Who's emailing me? Oh, I got to get back to them. And you haven't even gotten out of bed yet. You've already set the tone for the rest of your day. So I'm huge on like the way you start your day is going to dictate that. And I love that in Zivli, Dr. Morgan, you're so big on starting with your, um, with your, um, with your um, definite purpose and, and starting your day off with intention and in peace. And then you can add in all of the emails and the busyness of everything. And then the other thing that I'm really big on is how much are you on social media, especially if you're somebody that's dealing with health issues. If you're following a bunch of, account of accounts that it's all about health, that can be super helpful because you're learning and that's great. And as someone that creates content myself, um, it's awesome to learn and go there and hear answers that maybe you're not hearing from your doctor, but at the same time, it's like a double-edged sword. It can be triggering. It can be, it can make you, you know, we have mirror neurons. So if you're reading something or hearing about somebody else's issue, your nervous system is going to mirror that because we, we see something we're like, Oh, I have that. And then the whole, you know, cycle begins. And so I would say, and I have to tell some of my clients sometimes like a week off social media, like you you're scrolling and you think you have everything you're seeing. Um, that is one way I did a three, I think a two or three month social media fast last fall. And it was life-changing. I'm telling you life-changing. So yeah, th that's probably my, one of my biggest favorites is, is just watching it and paying attention to who you follow. If you follow accounts that make you feel crummy, maybe you mute or unfollow. That's, that's a biggie or you don't realize it, how that's affecting your, your nervous system and your, your overall health. Mm -hmm. And comparison, I think is a big one too. There is a I'll always remember in the sorority house, I was in Gamma Phi at UNL mm -hmm. and someone had the sign on her door. Comparison is the thief of joy. Yeah. And I think that it's true. So I really guard my, like you said, boundaries, I guard my attention yeah. and I guard my energy fiercely. And yeah. if I'm experiencing negativity, I'm really quick to assess the situation, ask why, and put a boundary up because yeah. any negativity will contribute to feelings of depression, right? And oh, feelings yeah. of anxiety and feelings of comparison. And that's not helpful when we want to live like a vital um, and healthy life. And I know that there are circumstances. I'm thinking of one of our Zivli members who's a caregiver. Mm -hmm. That's not going to be always a positive experience. Like there are certain things, if, if parts of your job or if parts of your life, they're just not joyful experiences. Okay. Okay. Like we get that, but I also challenged, I challenged her today in office hours. I said, I want you to come back and tell me 10 things that bring you joy. Yeah. And so if you're going through depression right now, and you haven't already like had some time to sit down and journal about what brings you joy, and then intentionally incorporating more of those people and activities and circumstances in your life, 
on a weekly basis, that's a really positive thing to do. So I think Ashley and I just like spat off, you know, so many things that bring us joy and peace and relaxation for that parasympathetic nervous system. But if you feel stuck in fight or flight, get a journal, get a pen, write down what brings you joy and then go schedule that massage or go, go schedule that haircut or go schedule that exercise session or get a gym membership or connect with a friend. But we have to really value the connection between our mental health and our emotional health and our physical health. And really when I say like, we talk about weight loss a lot, right. But it's like, if you're going to lose weight, you have to do it in a way that's healthy for you physically, mentally, and emotionally. Right. And so I think that's kind of where I wanted to tie up this conversation is like getting healthy is not just about getting physically healthy. It's about getting mentally and emotionally healthy as well. So thanks for sharing your story with us today. Absolutely. It's an honor. And I just wanted to say not separating the physical, the mental and the emotional, it's all connected. I I feel like our medical system does a lot of separating everything. Um, And then just being able to realize that we're a whole and and that those all, um, interplay with each other. And so balancing all of that can absolutely help you um, get well and stay well. But thank you so much for having me again. It's been so much fun and such an honor. Thank you so much. We'll talk soon. Okay. Bye-bye.